Welcome back. We're going to continue in the Foundations of Trauma-Informed Care series in the science of trauma. And specifically, we're going to continue talking about neurobiology, focusing on the four functions of the brain and how they are impacted by trauma and toxic stress. We're going to explore executive functioning, sensory awareness, attention, and memory. Our executive functions are functions such as our ability to make decisions. It's our planning and especially thinking like forward. It's our reasoning and judgment. It includes our impulse control. And in times of significant stress or trauma, you might start to think about how, how well or how are these things impacted for yourself? Do you have difficulty making decisions? Do you have difficulty planning forward? Have you gotten home from a work day and actually had a refrigerator full of food and still couldn't decide what to make for dinner? And as we think about this, like how could you use this information about executive functioning to adjust your expectations of others and ourselves? If your team is experiencing significant stress, can you reduce decision-making? Or maybe this isn't the time to do long-range planning. The second function that gets impacted by toxic stress and trauma is our sensory awareness. So in these times of threat and perceived threat or, or times of activation, another way to say that, then our senses become heightened. So our eyes get really focused. You know, we, we can we smell in a certain way, touch, sound, taste. So I want you to take a minute and see if you can make sense of why in a time of threat or fear, your senses would heighten and how it helps you. Like it makes sense that you'd want kind of supersonic hearing. So you might be able to hear what door to leave from or notice who's coming in or coming out. But we also want you to think about the impact of this. And so many organizations actually take a moment and to do a sensory scan of the spaces and places that those being served will be in as well as the workforce. And are there certain adjustments that you can make to your environment to lessen sensory input, especially it's overloading? Because if you're constantly paying attention to the senses around you, you're not able to then maybe hear the directions that you need to hear. Hear your name called, right? A third function of the brain that is impacted by trauma and toxic stress is our memory. So trauma actually decreases the size of the hippocampus, which impacts our memory of things like facts and information. So what's important to know about this is that the impact on the memory is that you will remember things that are threatening. You will have long-term memory, but what you're likely not to do is have, you won't remember that you have an appointment at two o'clock tomorrow. And this is why, you know, things like having reminder calls for appointments are really important. This is why putting strategies in for yourself to remember that meeting you have, or, you know, especially in times of toxic stress, what can you do to maybe increase those reminders about what you need to get done? The fourth function of the brain that is impacted by toxic stress and trauma is our attention. Have you found for yourself that it has been hard to pay attention during times of toxic stress? So what we know we're good at in those moments is actually something called, you know, is, is divided attention, sometimes also known as hypervigilance. So we're actually able to pay attention to a lot of stimuli at once. What we're not often able to do is to have what's called selective attention. And selective attention is basically what we're asking you to do right now. We're asking you to tune out everything around you and to hear my voice and to look at the, the screen and see words to just pay attention to this one thing. That's very challenging if you're experiencing significant stress or you're activated. So we want to think about how might that be misinterpreted? How might someone, you know, might they look distracted or non-compliant, right? Or like they don't care. One of the things I think is important as we think about attention and memory and sensory awareness and executive functioning is, is in trauma-informed care, we want to make sure that people aren't being 
um, blamed or harmed because these things are happening. So if there's a lot of sensory overload in our lobbies, it may be hard to start to think about, maybe hard for someone in that moment to be able to listen for their name. They might have to leave, or maybe someone doesn't remember they have an appointment and then they're not able to get another one, right? So we're really starting to think about the impact of these things on ourselves, as well as what processes and procedures can we put in play um, knowing this information. So an applied learning an activity here is to think about a time when you experienced an activated response, aka flipped your lid. What helped you to be ready to re-engage again? Also think about how you maybe have supported someone else who is experiencing activation. How confident are you in that? What did you find your skill set was? And we always want you to be thinking about what would all this look like within the work day and within the work spaces, spaces and places. So we've talked about the four functions of the brain. We also want to offer you kind of this, this understanding from Bruce Perry's neurosequential model. And Bruce Perry's work tells us that the brain actually has kind of an order to it. And that order goes that there is input, both somatic input and then sensory input that, that your body and brain pick up on. And that what needs to happen then is there needs to be, you need to be regulated, you need to be able to relate and then you get to the cortex part of the brain, which is the reasoning and reflection. And this can be just a really great three words to hold on to. Am I regulated? Am I able to relate that? Then I get to reasoning and understanding innovation and new meaning. And, and to think a little bit more about this is the reason we, you know, the reason regulation has to happen is that if you're in fight or flight or fight or fright, you can't get to reasoning. So regulation is not meant like, you're, you know, perfectly well, and all things are great, but you're out of a freeze, flight, fight, or fright moment. Then you're able to co-regulate and to relate, and co-regulation helps us self-regulate. So there's a relationship there, and it helps us with understanding and perception. And then reasoning again is that place we're often trying to get to in our work and, and um, in our work environments. Another way to think about this is that that state of regulation is the question from the brain is, am I safe? And at that state of relate and relationship is, am I cared for? Do I belong here? And that state of reasoning is, what can I learn from this? What can I take away from this? One of the things that is, is very true is oftentimes when we talk about trauma in the brain, we kind of think about just the brain, right? But we know there's an ever growing body of research that shows that trauma is stored in our body. The Nagowski sisters who wrote a book called Burnout talk about emotions or cycles that happen in your body. They are neurological events, not just happenings in your brain, but in your whole nervous system. And that's going to be really important for us to hold on to um, as we think about trauma-informed care and the impact of toxic stress and trauma on the brain and the body and the nervous system. The Nagowski sisters continue to say that emotions are an involuntary neurological response, that they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I appreciate that they, they talk about the feelings are tunnels that you have to go all the way through to get to the light at the end. And that importantly, that exhaustion happens when we get stuck in an emotion. And as we think about kind of the impact of trauma on our brain functioning and our bodies and our central nervous systems, they offer seven things that we know based on a variety of pieces of research that actually help us complete that stress cycle. It doesn't mean we're taking the stressor away, but that we're completing the stress cycle, kind of getting through that tunnel. And those things are one, moving your body in the way that your body lets you move, deep breathing, positive social interaction, laughter, a long hug. This is a hug with someone for whom you have a relationship with, a big cry, and then creative expression. So one thing for you to begin thinking about is to what extent can these behaviors, any of those seven things, be incorporated into your work, both formally through policies and procedures. You can might think about how you hold meetings and also informally, how you might just bring forth these seven things as part of like the culture of your team. So as we think about this trauma-informed care work, Think about it so that using that understanding is because of our understanding of toxic stress and trauma and its impact on our, 
on our function of our brain and our central nervous system and our body, that because of that, in trauma-informed care, we are aiming to create relationships, work cultures, and environment that foster regulation and healing. And in trauma-informed care, we realize and we reiterate that that work is going to happen through multiple pathways. There's not one way or one policy or one strategy, but that we need multiple pathways to recovery and resiliency.